Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Sashwati Tripathi, Assistant Professor from General Management Department, Birla Global University. I welcome you all one of the largest webinars organized by us in recent times. We have 2,500 participants who have registered for this uh, discussion today. I hope you all are safe and healthy. The COVID-19 pandemic is set to change the world sooner than we know. The global pandemic has taken a massive hit on all the sectors of economy. While it has been slightly easier for uh, multinational companies and professionals to adopt work from home as a new normal and continue business as usual, the times have been very, very challenging for the education system around the world. Though the crisis is devastating, it is making our schools uh, and even colleges technologically advanced. So uh, today's topic is technology, future and education. And for this discussion, we have with us Mr. Gyan Dash as our chief speaker of this session. Mr. Gyan Dash is the president and founder of JRD Consultancy USA. He is a technologically visionary and executive consultant in Silicon Valley. He focuses on enterprise solutions such as cloud computing, big data and analytics use of machine learning and scalable systems for mission critical business solutions. He spent around 10 years at Oracle Corporation and was the senior vice president of architecture and technology. He was responsible for setting Oracle's core database and application server product directions and interacted with customers worldwide in translating future needs to product plans. Prior to joining Oracle, he spent 16 years at IBM's Silicon Valley Development Lab in various positions, including development of TB2 family of products and in charge of IBM's database architecture and technology. He graduated from NIT Raukela in mechanical engineering and won the best graduate gold medal. Then he did his postgraduate degree in systems design from University of Waterloo, Canada in 1972. Mr. Dash is an eloquent speaker at industry forums around the world on the future of software technology. He sits on several boards and advisory boards of companies. Mr. Dash is well versed with the ancient Indian epics like the Mahabharata, the Ramayana and Srimad Bhagavad Gita. He is also a noted feature writer in newspapers. He is very familiar with Orissa's households for his America Chitti in Samaj Daily. We welcome you, sir. We have Professor Parameshwar Naik, Dean Bella School of Management, as the moderator of this session. Dr. Naik is an alumnus of Delhi University and an adjunct professor in human resource management, an academic administrator, a corporate trainer, and a management consultant. He has about 31 years of experience in India and overseas, including 19 years of leadership in positions like Dean and Director at several institutions across the country. He has 300 uh, trainings and management development programs and 23 research projects to his credit. He also have received the NIPM National HR Excellence Award uh, in 2018 in the category of Best Management Education Leadership and Award and Elvina the Luke Award, Delhi University and a Doctoral Fellowship from ICSSR. He has published two books and 29 research papers in journals of repute. We also have uh, Professor Samson Maharana, the Dean School of Commerce, uh, as the initiator of this session. Professor Samson Maharana has 38 years of teaching and research experience in the PG level at Utkal University. In addition to academics, he also has vast administrative experience in senior level of university administration as director of college development council, controller of finance, and chairman of uh, post of postgraduate departments. Professor Maharana has completed the one year FDP in management from pre prestigious IIM Ahmedabad and received advanced training in project appraisal from Reserve Bank of India, Banker Training College at Mumbai. From Professor Samson Marana was a former member of the Fifth State Finance Commission, Government of Odisha. He is also the independent director of few state level public sector enterprises in the state. Professor Marana has written two books on new entrepreneurship and emerging trends in banking and finance. 
We have amongst us uh, Professor Bhimal Chandra Mishra, Controller of Finance, Controller uh, of Examination as the organizer of the session. Professor Bhimal Mishra was a Group A officer of the Government of Odisha, belonging to the cadre of Odisha Education Service. He served premier government colleges of the state in various capacities. Apart from teaching, he has also vast administrative experience. He has publications and scholars as well to his credit. After retirement, Professor Mishra is serving this university as professor in finance and accounting and controller of examination. I welcome you all, sir. Uh, now I would like to request Professor Mishra to establish the context of today's discussion. Respected panelists of today's international webinar, Professor Saswati and Professor Bhamta and dear participants. At the outset, I welcome you all to this international webinar organized by Villa Global University. As all of us know, technology has become the lifeline of modern civilization. Therefore, Terry Turkle, one of the eminent professors of MIT, MIT has rightly said that we depend more on technology nowadays than believing each other. If we dig our past, if we see Mahabharat, then Mahabharat war was fought with weapon much technologically advanced. If we see the ruin of Indus Valley civilization, then ruins of Indus Valley civilization proves that our ancestors were also using technology. Now, the world has become such that without technology, one cannot move. Technology has become a part of life. But simultaneously, I want to say that technology is not only a life giver, but also a life taker. As John F. Kennedy, the former president of United States of America says, technology can destroy poverty and technology can also destroy human life. In this backdrop, we are going to examine the role of technology technology future and its role in education. We have in our midst Mr. Gyanaranjan Das, the noted computer scientist, the noted consultant, and the founder and CEO of JRD Consultancy, who has vast experience and who will enlighten us in this field. I once again welcome you all to this international webinar and Hope deliberations today will be definitely conclusive and lively. Over to Professor Saswati. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for setting the tone of this discussion and uh, beautifully establishing and correlating with uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana. Uh, now, I would request uh, Professor Mahadana to initiate the discussion. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Saswati. Uh, thank you, Professor Naik, the Dean School of Management, and uh, Professor Mishra. Uh, good morning, and hearty welcome to Mr. Gyanaranjan Das, the international renowned IT consultant and the main attraction of today's webinar. We are certainly privileged to have you, sir, amongst us today in this webinar. Even though you are a regular speaker in top class educational institutions around the world, and also you have visited several times to IIT Bhubanesha, today for the first time you are addressing the webinar being organized by the Villa Global University. Uh, we are lucky to have you among us today. Mr. Gyandas will speak on a topic which has become important in the current global pandemic situation with a serious impact on all sectors of the economy including the education. When you look at the extent of impact on education, even the word unprecedented will be an understatement. Education sector across the globe has been facing serious challenges. The challenge is from within and from outside. Under compulsion, 
the institutions starting from the school level to the higher education and the university they have uh, they have been experimenting with a different type of online teaching and evolution using different platforms from a predominantly brick and mortar traditional classroom teaching institutions have trying to shift to digital online click and portal based on teaching and learning there are of course a number of challenges the institutions are facing in in terms of cost in terms of retaining and attracting students flexibility access of the new technology for all the students engaging the students under the new system and training of the faculty however my my observation is that the most important challenge is how to change the curriculum course curriculum at the higher education level which will change in line with the changes taking place in the industry the covid virus may disappear in a few months or a year but it has had a lasting impact on the functioning of the industry in most countries of the world there is a deep rooted economic recession uh, seriously challenging the sustainability of the companies both large and small the companies are trying their best to cope up with the new volatile situation by adopting new technology to improve the productivity reduce cost improve quality of service expand the market this is going to affect the job scenario including the work culture and the skill requirement of the new recruits what are these new technology based requirement and how fast the higher education institutions are able to incorporate these new skills into their course curriculum that will decide that will determine the success and sustainability of the institution in the days to come we know that india produces or uh, india is on the largest it produces the largest number of graduate and post graduates in the whole world both technical and managerial in order to ensure that we reap the benefit of demographic dividend from the large base of technically competent manpower we need to match the skills of our students with those needed by the corporate it is in this background today we have with us mr ganranjan das who will be speaking on the topic technology future and education i am sure that this particular discussion and deliberation will be highly educative to all the participants the teachers scholars and the students i once again welcome you sir to this particular webinar thank you sir thank you sir thank you for uh actually elaborating on the need of you know shift in skills and employability of graduates and management graduates uh, now i would like to request uh, professor knight to deliberate on uh, this topic technology future and education and carry on the discussion yeah good morning uh, everybody i have this opportunity to meet uh, mr ganavanjan das first time online i welcome you to our university and particularly to the discussion as a moderator of this uh, webinar i i think instead of sharing my personal views on this which uh, may not be that much important as we uh, listen to uh, the expert mr ganaranjan das therefore i will uh, prefer to have a kind of conversation with him and uh, initially i would uh, request him to Uh, really uh, share some of his uh, thoughts about the topic of the on the topic of this webinar and then we'll go to a specific uh, question and answer kind of sessions ladies and gentlemen we all know that we are living in a global village which is very interconnected with the super highways of technology particularly digital technology which has crossed the and transcended the boundaries of all nations the digital technology and particularly the internet has made our world flat virtually flat you see this uh, particular moment at this particular moment we people sitting in india are uh, having the opportunity to share the flat screen of the laptop or the mobile with uh, mr gyanranjan das who is sitting at the other side of the on the other side of the earth uh, in us so you can understand that how powerful is the digital technology so particularly the covid 19 pandemic situation we have seen how uh, powerful is uh, the technology and uh, 
it has impacted all sectors of economy all sectors of business including education there is a serious concern about the this technological transformation that are happening and particularly in the some of the traditional businesses in the areas of fmcg healthcare hospitality transport and also the education sector this has occurred in a great change in the conventional economy we foresee more of such uh, transformation in the post covid era so in this context i would request uh, mr gyananjan das to kindly share his thoughts on the technological trends and the emerging education for a few minutes to just to start the ball rolling okay. mr das thank you thank you all i'm uh, i'm impressed that uh, 673 people are listening to this uh, webinar and um, it's night time here in silicon valley and uh, the technology is right in front of you we are using go to webinar which is part of the citrix company and other people are using zoom so let me start um let me can you see the screen this coming yes yes sir, yes, sir. Okay. okay so i'll i will take a few minutes just to highlight the the i'll just quickly talk about where the industry of computing is we are all affected by this i'll just touch on cloud computing business analytics artificial intelligence and i'll conclude with education university very quickly so the computing industry you know i uh, i like to start with uh, uh with some laws you know the uh, uh so human civilization has seen major upheavals and progress we have gone through two major ages the agricultural age which lasted for 900 years and the then followed by the industrial age which lasted for 150 years when we saw the steam engine ic engine factories manufacturing air travel phone service antibiotics the list is long then came the third came the information age i roughly the start is 1950 so we are halfway we are 70 years and we have seen a evolution from mainframe to mini computers to personal computers to internet to wearable computers to internet of things and each era becomes shorter in years that's very interesting next they say is biotech so let's take a look at some just for fun let me show you in 1953 this gentleman you know, his name was Horv Grosch, he's a German guy. And he said, the bigger the computers, the better they are. And he even had a formula. The cost of a computer grows only as the square root of its speed. So this is how the mainframe started. Then came, um, then came Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel and the famous Moore's law, 1965, saw the beginning of the personal computer the semiconductor industry and his law was microprocessor capacity doubles every 18 months and i had the chance to meet gordon moore many years ago and he's the older guy he's no more so i said hey gordon where did you come up with this idea you have, you must be having some kind of a vision so he smiled at me he said it was a beautiful spring morning i was driving on this highway I just said something, I had no idea what I said, then it became a law. So now we saw the growth of these Intel semiconductors, the growth of the personal industry, the computer. Bob Metcalf was the father of Ethernet. In 1980, he said the connected computers are better. And he had a formula, the value of a network is worth to the population is proportional to the square of the number of users. This is how the telephone system grew exponentially. This is how the internet grew exponentially. This is how Facebook grew in, you know, exponentially, social networking. So this is the beauty of Metcalf's law. Then Mark Weiser, now look at the year 1991. And that's like what, 19 plus, uh, nine plus well, 30 years ago. He said, invisible computers embedded in everyday objects. And his, uh, his statement is very profound. The most fundamental technologies are those that disappear. <laughs> can you hear me yes sir yes okay. the most fundamental technologies are those that disappear 
they weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it, like electricity. So now we are in that age. So let me show you pictorial. Go from the left. Mainframe computing dominated the decade of the 50s, 60s. Mini computers came. Prime, Wong, digital equipment. Suddenly they were dominant in the 60s. Then the PC came. I was at IBM when IBM lost the PC in 1981. And right next door to me here, Apple started a couple of years before that. So the PC started and the Intel duopoly, Intel, Windows and Intel became the monopolies uh, because the, the Windows became the operating system for the Intel microprocessor. Then came the desktop, desktop internet computing in the 1990s. Now we are into this millennium now we are into mobile internet computing. This is the evolution of the computing. Now let's quickly touch on what is cloud computing. Now, because of cloud computing, we are able to talk to all of you in this webinar. Cloud is very much a part of our life. Gmail is cloud. Salesforce is cloud. But what, what does it mean? It's on-demand self-service, broad network access, location independence, rapid elasticity, and the type of services, there is infrastructure as a service. You see the very last bullet. Infrastructure as a service is where the Amazon AWS web services, Microsoft Azure, Google's computing platform, they all come. They provide the hardware. They have huge data centers with huge amount of computing capacity, networking capacity. This is how we are able to do what we are doing right now. Then there is a platform as a service. This is where developers can develop stuff. Then the, the obvious one is software as a service. This is where Salesforce, Gmail, your go-to webinar, your Zoom, all these things. And the types of cloud, you can have public cloud, which is the Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google. Then there is private cloud because you are concerned about security. Banks and others are very uncomfortable putting all their stuff in the public cloud. So they want to have a private cloud within their firewall. Then there is community cloud. Universities have got some cl a cloud system that is only catering to the education world, healthcare. But hybrid is a mixture of these, these ones. Again, let me touch on the third topic. I mean, we can talk for a whole day. I, can, I give talks on for hours on details. I'm just touching. So look at how analytics has evolved. On the y-axis, you have re business return on investment. And on the x-axis, you go, so we started from the little circle on the bottom called what happened? This is called the post-mortem. How many COVID patients were detected between you know, February 15th and April 20th? If you ask a question like that, we can go back to the data. We can find out what happened. I call this driving a car, looking at the rear view mirror. Then the next question, why did it happen? This is where the information and knowledge comes in root cause analysis. Then future then comes intelligence from prediction, optimization, automation, what will happen? Finally, insights, can I go deeper? What is the best that could happen? And can I have prescription recommendations so that I can uh, assess the impact and avoid disasters? This is the, the evolution of analytics over the last few years. We have data warehousing, data lake, there's all sorts of details. I'm skipping all that. Let me touch on artificial intelligence. This is very much in the subject. Artificial intelligence is broad category. And uh, the, uh, you know, the very fact that we have, uh, we have the artificial general intelligence is where the, the machine can mimic human intelligence. We are not there yet. We are in a narrow AI scope right now. Narrow AI does face recognition, auto tagging of photos in the Facebook, auto correction in email and messages, speech recognition, facial recognition, recommendation engine, natural language processing. You speak in English, the other side, somebody is uh, listening to that and answering in Hindi. So there is translation that translates the speech from one end to the other. A subset of AI is called machine learning. And a subset of machine learning is called deep learning. So machine learning, you feed a lot of data. 
and experiences, and it comes up with some deep insights using some statistical techniques. And deep learning is using a neural network, like how we have the human neural network. If you give a vast amount of data, it can do some pattern checking. Like it can say from a thousands of pictures, you can isolate those pictures which are the picture of a cat or a dog. So if you put all this together, there's the whole big world of big data where you have the, the volume, velocity, variety, uh, that's in the petabytes, huge amounts of data. Then you have data mining, data science. Then you on the side, you have the artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning intersecting. And this is becoming a very key element for the future. If those of you who are a little more curious, I'll show you in the classical programming, you feed on the left side rules and data, if then else rules and data outcomes the answers. The new world of machine learning, you feed answers and data outcomes the rules. This is the difference between classical programming and machine learning. Now, universities play a very big role. Let me show you. Stanford University, which is not far from where I'm sitting, has spun off many, many companies. There is only a subsidy shown here. Instagram, Google, YouTube, Sun, all these kids who started these companies, they came out of Stanford University. Netscape, Cisco, MIPS. This is very important because there is a very deep connection between, see we have within 30 miles here, we have Stanford University and University of California at Berkeley. Between the two of them, they have over 30 Nobel laureates. 30 professors who have got Nobel Prize within a distance of 30 miles. I mean, these two campuses are filled with talents, but they are not isolated. They are not doing research and writing papers. They are very connected. So let me summarize. We need India 2.0, a phase of innovative products and solutions, not just outsourcing entity. I mean, that phase is gone. This cheap labor has limited half-life. Tomorrow, Philippines and Taiwan will beat you in price. So that's why the TCS and Infosys and all, our problem is when the kid gets a job at Wipro, then there's a celebration. We should be very sad because that's not the future. Is the you know, mind tree, Wipro, I mean, there is no innovation there. It's all babysitting. I mean, I'm harsh, but I have been saying this at uh, NASCOM and all these keynotes I give. Universities must have strong link to the industry, which is a weak point in India, my observation. I mean, it's improving in bits and pieces. IIT Bombay has done some few things, but we have a long way to go. The focus has to be on research. It must be relevant, not just writing papers and feeling good. Somebody says, I have 27 papers, you have only 15, I'm better than you. I think that attitude has to change. Even undergraduate program must emphasize non-linear thinking because we have this rote learning that, you know, we have to think about some ideas people, kids can come up with, you know, some non-linear thinking. And there is no replacement to hard work. So the, you know, the fourth chapter in Bhagavad Gita says, karmanya evo badhikarat, you know, adhikarate, karmanya badhikaraste. You have only right to work, not the results. Focus on your work, don't worry about it. But we are so concerned about, you know, what will, what will happen, what will happen, we mess up the work. And finally, it's a, there's a huge opportunity ahead for the young generation. I mean, there is on, on, unimaginable opportunity. We, are, we have barely started in many of these fields. So therefore, that's the remark. I will stop there just to set the stage so we can have a continued discussion. Thank you, Mr. Das. You have really set the ball rolling and uh, you have touched upon uh, many important, uh, you know, concepts or the technologies that we are uh, really going to discuss on in detail, like cloud computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, business analytics, and also about the, the use of such technology in education today, uh, big data, big uh, data science, etc. We are thankful to you for clarifying those people who didn't have their basics of understanding of these concepts. I think now it is clear. Now let us go deeper into these subjects a little more. Uh, all of us are experiencing that how technology act, acts as a diving force in solving the business problems today. And these, these tools are very powerful. So uh, let us start with a discussion on cloud computing. 
Mr. Yeah. Das, uh, what is the role of cloud computing in business and education in particular in the current and post-COVID scenarios? Well, and what is the what is the driving force behind cloud computing trends? Well, right now, in the last three four months since the lockdowns, you know, all the schools and colleges are closed, and everybody is going through. Uh, you know, net, internet based education sitting at home. Teachers are giving lessons to even small kids. And uh, so, suddenly, the, um, they're all using either Google Meet or Zoom or one of these collaboration software where, just like we are doing right now, a teacher can, you know, can go through the lessons and give some homeworks. And, and the students, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how much dependency the education system has on this this is all cloud this is all because of cloud what cloud computing is you don't it is a personal computer uh you know at one time uh you know people thought you know that's the future that uh, it's like you know we are all trying to create uh, a, a electricity in the backyard of our house that doesn't work somebody is in charge of it's a utility somebody is in charge of producing power whether it's hydroelectric or nuclear or steam thermal and the engineers are paid to take care of that you and i don't worry about oh this is uh, june i should get my power from hirakud the hydroelectric plant oh in july i'm going to switch to thermal we don't go through that that's not your and my job we just flip the switch and we expect the electricity to show up so computing has reached that point it took a long time computing as a utility i should be able to plug in and get access computing power so large companies universities they are they're saying we don't have to have a staff and have buy computer see the, the you know you have two kinds of cost the capital expense of creating a data center you probably know in your university when you try to put computers and servers and networks it is very time consuming and costly and so you don't want to go through any of that you say i don't want to install anything i just want to rent the service it's like renting so you rent the hardware and there are huge data centers so there are ibm is offering it amazon is offering it uh, microsoft is offering it oracle is offering it everybody is saying come to me i'll charge you a monthly fee it's just like you pay the rent and it's based on utility you only pay as much as you use that's why a uh, long time ago i remember in 2003 i just left oracle and somebody introduced me to the cto of amazon the chief technology officer. He's a Dutch guy. He's gone, somebody else has taken over. So he met me for two hours and he asked me a lot of technical questions. I said, wait a minute, you sell books. Why are you asking me about this service oriented architecture and all that? He said, you don't understand. Jeff Bezos, our CEO, has given us marching orders that I have invested in these huge data centers to do my business, e commerce. And I was told that there, the utility of that is 30%. That means 70% of the time, these data centers things are, are not being used. Now figure out way I can monetize. So he started the concept of EC2, Elastic Computing Cloud. He started the concept of S3, Simple Shared Storage. So suppose you have uh, your global university at Virla, you want, you want to buy some storage. In the old days, you would go to one of the storage suppliers and say, I want to buy X gigabytes petabytes how much do i have to spend they say you have to spend three crores that kind of capital expense now he said pay me only one lakh i'll give you the same capacity now look at the contrast from three crore to one lakh you know is a huge big difference so that's how the whole thing started you know it's a storage network computers everything is rented everything is available at your fingertips this is the cloud revolution suddenly we don't need to install any of that. There are experts who are taking care of it, just like power, just like water distribution, just like the phone system, right? We don't worry about the phone network or grid or anything like that. So that's the, that's the and, and the relevance of cloud computing is so universal. I don't know where, where there, I think it is so universal that you, you can't find anybody who's not using it. Education particularly, big user, remote learning has become the norm now they are saying post covid many universities are saying we may continue to do this thing there will be classroom education but again they will have a hybrid they'll have a combination of both manufacturing um, you know utilities 
uh, you name it, you know, healthcare. Uh, now people are doing, you know, my doctor wanted to talk to me and it was a video chat, right? It's all remote. So, so I think cloud has got a tremendous implication, but remember the principles. It is all, you pay as you use based on utility. Today you pay 100, tomorrow you may pay 20 because it's elastic. You don't have to keep on, you know, spending and spending and not using. <clears throat> so that's very important. Sir, uh, I just uh, wanted to know your views. Like these days, like uh, many uh, cloud computing platforms like Zoom or uh, you know other platforms that we are using for yeah. delivering our lectures, you know some of them uh, have given the free access right. uh, for some time. See, the COVID situation is such that we all have to depend on the such kind of uh, platforms for long. Right. How do you think that how costly it would be for the academic institutions like ours, uh, university, to depend fully on such platforms? Whether it will the more the people will depend on this platform, the cost will go up or it will come down. Well, cost will come down as the usage goes, but you have to look at it from their point of view. Just, uh, for them, they have to spend money. Zoom. I know the guy Eric Yuan, the founder of Zoom, who was at Cisco. Uh, Cisco bought a company called Webex and he yes. learned his lessons and he started this company and he just uh, they just switched to a huge Oracle cloud decision because their growth in December their, their number of users were like 10 million by February it became 100 million by April it became 400 million it's called scale the rapid way numbers are growing I mean you you know, you'll see smoke out of your computers if you don't have enough capacity. You got to have capacity, you got to have reliability, you got to have performance, and you got fast speed. So those are so they have to spend a lot of money. So for them, it's not free. For so the, therefore, they they try. I mean, Zoom is at least giving you a free. You know, like they say, hundred users, but forty minutes is the limit, right? Then for. Yeah. for for you to go to unlimited uh, number of uh, hundred users, you have to pay. I don't know in Indian rupees, but here it's like fifteen dollars a month or something. So I think I think because of the success of Zoom, Microsoft team has come very aggressively trying to offer some free stuff. But I, yeah. I believe I don't know this. I believe that they will have special discounts for educational institutions, schools, colleges, universities, because always because always they realize that industries can afford a uh, huge amount of money but you know industry education definitely will get some some break i am sure and yeah, uh, but, you. but you, you, yeah. you can you can not have it i mean look uh, even if you have classroom education back i think we are, will reach a point, nothing can beat the face to face teaching i mean i yes, don't get i mean the, you know at least you have a chance to interact students can talk to themselves you know there is a much more dynamics when you have people sitting in a classroom interacting with the teacher that won't go away that will be there but i think these alternatives also bring some very interesting uh, you know situation like what we are going through right now uh, you know yes. it's, it is you know impossible without these technologies true sir thank you very much uh, i will now go to uh, another uh, technology that robotics, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which you spoke about and differentiated how machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, deep learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, if a machine can think more intelligently than what we do, then where should we be? Artificial intelligence, the quintessential machine learning a technology with spirit is dramatically reshaping and redefining not only the market and what companies can or cannot do with the customer's experience, but what we are at as individuals and groups. Artificial intelligence has major impact in all sectors of economy, as uh, Mr. Das has already explained, including education sector in recent years. It is now a part of our normal life. AI is highly inclu in, I, I mean, uh, included in our smart education as well. So uh, we have to prepare people for uncertainty, promote agility and adaptability. It needs an uh, orientation from primary school to university education. 
So how to uh, do that? What is the importance of uh, AI and various robotic applications in business and also in education, Mr. Das? Yeah, so um, see, the artificial intelligence is not a new phrase. I think if you go back, we started on this in the 1950s. And there was a there was a period where we called the AI winter. Winter means you know everything went dull, right? But the the phrase was coined artificial intelligence back in 1952 or 53, and there was a period where nothing happened because a couple of things. One, we didn't have the computing power. You need a huge amount of computing power because you know it's it eats data for breakfast. You know, it, 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 it's it's so much. You know, data is the the fuel. It's the oxygen. And uh, so, first of first question answer to your question is, when can it mimic the human intelligence? We have a long way to go, long long way. Don't worry about that, because uh, I think with all the advancements, we rarely rarely have a glimpse of how the neural system uh, in this brain works. You know, you smell a flower, and then it reminds you of. 20 years ago, you were sitting in somebody's backyard listening to this song when you smelled that flower. Look at the, the, the neural network based on one sense organs, the smell, which triggered all kinds of memories. It's unthinkable how the system works. We can't even fathom it. You test something, you said, oh my God, 23 years ago, I was visiting my aunt's house. She created something exactly like this. So that's that's something we have a long way to go. A lot of research on brain and neurons and all that. I won't worry about that. So I, I, we are still at the narrow AI, narrow artificial intelligence, not the AGI, general intelligence. That's far away. The narrow AI, according to some uh, McKinsey or somebody, they said it will add $13 trillion to the economy by 2030. And if when general thing came, you know, we are talking about much more. But let's not worry about the general part, the narrow part. What is within the narrow um, uh, intelligence? We see that almost day to day. When you type in a little message, it auto corrects it. Sometimes in a bad way, and you don't like it. But you know that that's uh, auto correcting emails and messages. Speech recognition, right? Recommendation in the engine. You buy something from Amazon or whatever Flipkart. And it says, because you liked A, you may like B, C, and D. Because it remembers who you are and your likes and dislikes, and it quickly links them. So recommendation engine. Natural language processing. Natural language processing is how we, we speak and talk in a natural way. So auto-tagging of photos, face recognition. And, uh, and then we can, we can go a little further into robotics, self-driving cars biotech um, you know biotech um, automation gene mapping and drug discovery these are where we see the real benefits coming with uh, with that kind of uh, processing but it requires huge i mean there are special chips now nvidia is a company that comes up with special chips for ai chips for for processing artificial intelligence so you are you have got somebody mark andreessen a good friend here he uh, founded netscape Mark said, um, software is eating the world. Then he said, AI is eating the software, right? You know, that's the joke, you know? So, so, so the, uh, I think it is, it is the uh, most important uh, aspect of it in a practical way is uh, in the area of prescriptive analytics. Can I look at huge amounts of data and come up with recommendation and prescription, find out the, and actionable find out go deep dive into the data figure out what's happening for example you know if you have a machine which is getting heated up and there's a threshold it has to stay within this temperature so there are sensors who are watching the temperature as as long as it comes close to three four degrees it wants somebody saying go do something it might overheat so you know like the joke was in the old days of analytics it used to take a week to do weather forecasting. Now it's no point in telling the, the farmer that it will rain yesterday. It's already rained. So after seven days, you are telling him it rained on Tuesday. He already knows it. What's the point? Right? So that's the that's the old world of postmortem. And but now the new world is can I go deep into the root causes 
can I find out the problem and take actions on it on, on, in time, in time, yeah. right? If a plane is flying and if there is an engine problem, can we give warnings in time so that we can safely land it before it something happens? This is where every all of this is AI uh, application. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, it's so important is uh, AI. But if when we are, we are talking about the future technology and we find that activation of uh, augmented reality, that is something called augmented reality, virtual trips, 3D printing, etc. Um, and also we talked about uh, virtual lectures and virtual learning using AI and robotics. So specifically for educational sector, please tell us something about uh, how uh, educational sector will benefit from AI and uh, particularly to work on adaptive learning to offer personalized teaching based on the learning uh, you know kind of requir requirements of students how the digital learning environment uses ai 3d gaming and computer animation in education yeah so, that's, that's a good point actually the vr ar the virtual reality and augmented reality we are still in the early stages i mean augmented reality you see this uh, hollow lens from microsoft you put these glasses on and uh, and you can see it in the screen projects all kinds of things there i think uh, the uh, in medical field for example uh, through those kind of augmented reality doctors a famous doctor sitting in in the tata institute in uh, in uh, bombay can uh, can watch the operation and advise the doctor because he can see what's going on so those classroom education you said yes you know you can have those kind of facilities where you can create a virtual classroom so the the person who's watching it he realizes he's almost sitting in a 3d classroom interacting with yes. the professor but physically they are not there they're in remote places but these is are it all... the same as hologram sir is it the same as oh, hologram no. Hologram is different. Hologram is, you know, you, you create uh, like you, Modi was doing hologram in, in the early elections where he didn't go there physically, but his image stood up. That's the extremely expensive and impractical thing that, uh, you know, that has no universal application. We had to get a lot of, uh, he spent a lot of money and get an expert from England to help him during the Gujarat elections where he tried it first, right? So, but that's, that's different. That's not uh, what we are talking about. But I think robotics uh, robotics is uh, becoming a very key area because uh, a lot of uh, human errors can be avoided, you know, manufacturing and all that. Uh, you, you see now the automobile factories and all that use huge amount of robotics in an assembly. So wherever we can avoid human error, we can, where can we are avoid fatigue, you know, somebody standing in a, in a, in a assembly line for hours you know human beings get tired when you get tired you do mistakes right but the robotics don't get robots don't get tired <laughs> so yeah you know, and, and and the other thing the 3d printing you talk about again you know it's uh, uh they're they're starting to do uh you know parts and stuff like that uh, using 3d printing that's a very interesting technology and it's still looking for applicability where can we use, properly use it right so yeah all these things you talk about is uh, uh, is the future so, so nowadays we hear about ai based language learning the language learning platforms with right. personalized learning approach please throw some light on that yeah so uh, the um, i just gave you i gave one example where you know if two people are talking over the telephone one is speaking english the other one is speaking french English guy doesn't know how to speak French. French person doesn't know how to speak English, but they're having a conversation. Right. Now you, you speak as if you are talking English to any somebody, and on the other end, by the time it goes to the other side, it has been translated into French. He speaks or he or she speaks answers in French gets translated into English. That that's why the the, the software has to recognize the speech, the accent. It's not easy. It's not simple as it sounds because everybody speaks differently. Yes. We, Indian, we Indians speak English with our own accent. You know, yes. the Spanish people speak in their accent. So you got to have the uh, the smartness of the software to to be able to guess 
what you are trying to say. <laughs> so there's a lot of pattern matching to make sure that what you are saying is this. So, so that's the speech recognition is one of them. And that same thing goes with language training. You know, it, uh, you can, you can uh, explain the language and words and meanings in your language. But that's, that's something I think people are using. So speech is a big part. Google is doing a lot of work in that. Very nice. Very. I mean, the interpreters are no more required in this kind right. of right. Yeah. Right. So okay. let us talk about some big data analytics. Yes, you wanted to say something? No, I said, um, what did I want to say? Um, yeah, these days, um, you know, when you when something goes wrong, you make a phone call for service, you don't hear a human. You hear a, 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 a you know, animated voice, right? And uh, the, the, that's all, that's all. So these the support services and all that are using technology uh, where it sounds like a human, but it's actually not a human, it's a machine talking to you. Exactly. So, exactly. Right. Yes, sir. So now let us talk something about, uh, you know, big data analytics, business analytics, data science. Uh, right. Please tell us about how to use or how useful it is, the big data analytics in business and uh, particularly to gain uh, in invaluable insights into the their daily operations yeah see data is um, you know i have been with data all my life you know we i built databases at ivm at uh, you know i was the chief technologist at oracle it's all about data so 20 20 years ago 30 years ago when i used to tell the world that data is the oxygen nobody listened to us i mean now they're all saying oh data is the fuel data is the electricity data is you know whatever uh, suddenly data becomes very key so as i said big data came after you know i think all this was when i designed db2 at ibm the design point was 64 gigabytes which is nothing i mean you can put a pen drive with that capacity and i said who the hell needs more than 64 gigabytes but now we are talking about petabytes and exabytes we are talking about huge amounts of data so suddenly after google and uh, some of these companies e-commerce companies like amazon google and all that the volume of data went up as i see big data has got three v's first is the volume huge amounts of, you know an aeroplane going from new york to london a 747 one trip produces 640 terabytes of data one plane one aeroplane one transatlantic flight produces 640 terabytes of data you know, all the temperatures, pressures, all that stuff that these sensors are capturing. Imagine there are 25,000 flights in those days, pre-COVID, every day crossing the Atlantic. Imagine the amount of data, that's the volume. What do you do with all this data? The answer is nothing. We can't even figure out why some planes go down. All this data is accumulated, but there's no uh, analysis. So the second V is the variety. So we used to do with numbers and characters for a long time. You have the name, address, etc. Very simple to put it on the database. Now we have voice, video, audio, maps, pictures. This is all part of the data, text. So now so there's a huge amount of variety. Suppose I tell you, can you tell me quickly from a geospatial database how many um, hospitals are there within two miles from your house, two kilometers of this address? Can you do that search? That's a geospatial search. Can you tell me within 15 kilometers of the Odisha assembly, how many healthcare providers are there? Can you do that search without talking to anybody? That is a geospatial search, right? The ge geographic data. So the variety of data has also grown like anything. So we need to deal with that. And the third thing is the velocity. Data is not static anymore. It's moving at a very high speed satellite data is coming down you know it's yeah. like a river flowing water in a river how do you deal with streaming data now everybody is sitting at home watching movies through netflix and whatnot that is all streaming youtube right so this is the video stuff getting streamed so there's a velocity part so we have to deal with this big data uh, i mean it's a long discussion i i was an advisor to the ceo yeah. of a company called mongodb they dealt with other types of data so the big data, now the question is data, is, we have figured out how to deal with this data. Now question is, how do you find a needle from a, hay, from a haystack? 
Little from haystack means you have billions and billions of bytes of data. You are looking for one little piece of information. How do you do that search? How do you do? So this analytics deals with deep diving and doing some very clever searches so that we can get answers from this volume of data. That's what, the, as I said in that chart I showed you, we started very simply. We started something on data warehousing. We took the operational data, like take the case of a store. Uh, the store has uh, details of every transaction. You know, all the items got that day, how much money was paid. Then at the end of the day or the week, we, we sort that data out into another place. We call it the warehouse. And so we don't interfere with the operational data. And that is called data warehouse. And we do all the analytics against that. So now the new world is data lake. You want to throw all kinds of data into a lake and do some transformation and all. So analytics is moving through a very rapid phase and it's very significant to business. You guys should be in your university, you should introduce this. This is a very important topic. The types of business analytics, right? The types of prescription yes. analytics, I think uh, you should get, get uh, fairly, that's, that's going to be a very key area. And this is where the intersection comes, your big data, your AI, and your, you know, your data engineering, data science stuff, everything intersects, right? But goes step by step. It can be very confusing. Last tell the essence of the data. So the, the whole idea is how do you collect the data? How do you scrub the data? Because data sometimes is not clean. And bad data is no good. <laughs> if the data is bad, the answer will be bad, right? So I'm told that... I'm told yes, that yes. Odisha, Odisha government is not producing any any statistics of data anymore. That's bad news. <laughs> uh, anyway, we have our in our course curricula about uh, these big data and analytics and all. But sir, please throw some light on uh, how to use big data in customizing a academic curricula in developing learning outcomes. Well, first of all, I think. Uh, I think you got to have a very strong feedback system. If you are teaching courses and students have been taking that course year after year, you should have a continuous cycle of asking the relevance of it. Has it helped people in their jobs? By having that kind of a feedback loop, you realize that whatever you have taught last year may not be the relevant, we got to make some changes. I think the attitude has to be, things can be static. Things have to keep on, moving and changing to, to make it relevant to the industry. In that case, I would recommend to you a link up with some of the industries, if you can. Then people who come for recruiting and all that, besides recruiting and HR, you should also try to find out, you know, can we collaborate with you in the area of analytics? Tell us what are the things you are trying to solve. And so that way you can introduce that into the course. So students going out of the college, they have got skills that are immediately useful, right? So something like that, think about it. You have to think out of the box. You can't go on just uh, repeating the same thing. Like somebody says, I have 20 years of experience. The other one says, no, you have one year of experience repeated 20 times. <laughs> it's a difference. You keep on doing the same thing 20 years, you know, there's no growth. You got to challenge. Sir, I, uh, uh, dear audience, and uh, I would like to ask the organizer, Ms. Dr. Bimal Misra, that should we continue for half an hour more, as you have already agreed? So yes, participants yes, yes. should know that we are having half an hour more time. Accordingly, I can I can uh, request uh, uh, Mr. Kanaranjan Das to uh, you know deliberate on certain more uh, uh, other issues. Yes. Sir. Are we permitted? Yes, so all the participants, please hold on. We have many more uh, things to discuss because 11 o'clock uh, was the time perhaps declared, but we have extended it to 11.30. So let us continue with our discussion. Uh, I, I must thank uh, Mr. Ganaranjan Das to really elaborating uh, I mean, uh, the subjects so well, and we are very much fortunate to have you, sir. So let us move to the day business analytics. Currently, business houses see the business analytics as uh, the rudder for planning and execution of their strategies for survival. It is now a 
believe that data driven decision making is a must for their survival and consequential kind of growth so now uh, please uh, share some thoughts on the uh, evolution of business analytics and how does it impact business and industry right so you have already shared some conceptual details about the business analytics in your presentation yeah, yeah so, no well, you know, look, I am impressed that you have 760 people uh, already attending. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's quite a number. Yes. Uh, we are so, thankful to all of them to yeah. stay on and a little learn more. I think in uh, another half an hour, we can spend meaningfully. Yeah. So business, what is business analytics? I mean, Business analytics is, you know, you take take an examples will be easier. Uh, let's say you, you know, take any sector, take retail. You are in the retail business, right? And you have got stores all over the country, and you have got goods coming in, selling. I mean, one of the big things in stores is the uh, shelf space. You have limited space in your shelves, and if they are not disappearing in time, and you are replenishing them you have a problem, right? I'll give you a very good example. Um, back when, uh, to, you know, 9-11, uh, 2001, when the big uh, problem happened in New York, you know, you know, the, the bombing of the, the New York towers and all that, you know, everybody was so, everybody was so stunned that day that uh, everything came to a standstill. People are totally awestruck with the, the devastation, right? So day two, you know, the, the biggest item sold in the store was the American flag. People felt so uh, patriotic. Everybody went out and bought a flag. The interesting question is day three. So day two, all the flags disappeared from the stores. And on day three, if you walk into a store and ask for a US flag, they say, sorry, no flags, all gone, except one company, which is Walmart. Walmart had the smarts to figure out on a daily basis which items are disappearing and the velocity so that overnight they had trucks carrying flags and replenish them in the stores. So day three, the only place they, they did many million dollars of business on that third day because if nobody else had the intelligence to understand that what is happening. This is business analytics. This is an example of a business who is using the data in time and figuring out what to do to sustain. So examples like they exist everywhere. Every business, you take utilities, you are a supplier of your geo or you are uh, whatever star, whatever India supplies the mobile phones. They're all anxious to see that their service is taken by more people, right? And geo is coming with a low price and they're sweeping over all the, the other competition, right? And so, so you have to know call records. You have a, you have a huge amount of data warehouse of call records. From the call records, you find out. Uh, so suppose somebody says, uh, how many, uh, what age group in the metropolitan area of Delhi are buying this phone, and you find out that age 14 or 8, 15 to 20 are buying this phone more than any other age group. Based on that nugget of information you can now take some actions or you want to ask you know access certain type of age groups who are uh, who are a little less price sensitive so you go do marketing to this age group saying you know the, here is the phone but you, it's all data driven like you said it's not random it's not guesswork right it has to be based on actual facts and data and unless you have the data uh, based information uh, you cannot make this this call. So this is all happening um, these days. When they, you must have seen that you buy something over the net, you see all kinds of advertisements are bombarded to you and similar items because somebody is looking at you. It's it's targeted to one consumer. You know, it's no longer you know groups. It's individual consumers, right? So business analytics becomes a fundamental piece of future of business. It applies to your your business, to education business. Who is taking sure. admission in your colleges? Which geographic area? What is the financial capability? How many are dropping out for what reason? 
I mean, you ask these questions every day, but you now have to scratch your head and guess. Maybe this is because of that. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Let us now discuss something on uh, more, little more on data science. Data science has emerged out of uh, the, is a strong contender for the most influential technologies of the 21st century. The abundance of data has enabled companies to fill their business with it. So how can the powerful data science tools such as the Google Analytics, Excel, Tableau, etc., help organizations to make them better and reach their market potential? First of all, data science is a very funny phrase. It is very ill-defined. When data science was coined, you know, people had no idea what that is. So because no universities had courses on data science, now they do. And so if you are a data scientist, let me tell you, you got to have these following skills. You must know algorithms. You must write some code. You must know statistics, right? You must know the business that you are involved with. And fourth one, you must be a good storyteller. What does that mean? Yeah. So you see, nobody teaches these four things to people. So uh, it's not the answers. It is coming up with what's the right questions to ask. See, that's the big difference. You know, standard thing is, you know, I give you a bunch of questions, give me the answer. That's the easy part. But the, quest, the key uh, data scientist has to come up with what is the right question to ask for this business? Do I know that? Sometimes I don't have an idea. So. I, I, I used to, you know, I used to have a client in Chicago and uh, I was recruiting for as a data scientist. And you know who I recruited? I recruited a, a Russian PhD rocket scientist who is a physicist. He worked in oh. Fermi lab and he came to me and I, I asked him, I said, take this information and by tomorrow, can you come up with, with some ideas, some models of what can be done? Just totally open ended. So next day he came up with, you know, amazing amount of insight that threw me off. I said, wow, I need you. I hired him instantly. I said, he's the right guy. So do you know the questions to ask? So data science, if you introduce data science at your university, look at some of the curriculum that Berkeley and others have introduced. Again, it's a little bit of statistics, little bit of algorithmic stuff, and, and, of, and, and what what is the the right questions to ask and how do you go about you know creating these these models i think that's the combination you should look at i don't know if in india they have got a program now anywhere in data science i, I don't know is there any university uh, uh, at this moment uh, i will not be able to give you the information uh, I haven't seen that in IITs. I haven't seen it. Uh, maybe I, you know, I don't know. I haven't, but I know here uh, it's only a couple of years old. There was a data science course at Berkeley, and they had 1,100 kids signed up. So they had to stop the <laughs> registration because of the demand. So the demand oh. is there, and many people learn the skills by themselves. The smart ones, they don't even though they don't take a course, they figure it out. You know, by their by their independent thinking and and by brilliance, uh, and they some of them become very good data scientists in the process. Again, remember the evolution chart I showed you from what happened, why did it happen, what will happen, and what can we do about it. So we are talking about at the top end of that. What can we do about? It? First of all, figure out what's happening, trends, prescriptions, future. That's the kind of skills we are looking at. Sir, would you little, I mean, elaborate a little more about use of data science in uh, basically, uh, you know, innovating the curriculum and uh, measuring the performance of instruction in academic institution a little more? Because we all are academician and we wanted to know how data science can be useful to, for us. Yeah, I think I, probably not the data science I'm talking about in that depth, but the simple insights. We are looking for insights and you know course curriculum and all that as you are preparing and planning i think you should look at some courses have got a lot of students attending so students go to courses because they somehow find a link to the things they are learning to or potential of getting a job 
or potential of using it in their life, right? And that's the truth. Why should I take these courses? Because opportunities are, are better. At one time, people uh, in my days, engineering was the big attraction field. Nobody wanted to study medicine. So I used to joke uh, in Ravensa College that some of the kids who didn't understand Newton's first law, I used to explain to them. When he said, I'm going to be a doctor, I said, you'll not see me as a patient. You are so gadha, I don't think you can be the right doctor. But now the, the, the flip, now the medical profession has got all the right kids going. So I think it's similar to that. You know, we have, um, we have to, I think, I think you distinguish yourself by focusing on these, you know, the, the, the data science part, the business analytics part, don't teach the normal stuff that uh, everybody and their uncle teaches. Try to be unique, try to say some, come up with something that is not easily available anywhere else. Then your demand will go up, people will come running. But that happens by doing some research and figuring out uh, what else is happening. And uh, I don't know exactly, uh, what happens in the educational institutions you know you uh, uh, i think people do analysis of uh, uh, some courses uh, saw a declining of students some courses saw an increase in students uh, and then you know uh, you have to figure out uh, again con industry connection is key in any of these data science business analytics you must have a link to the industry so that you can know firsthand what is the requirement out there so that you can train kids you know accordingly then you'll be serving the right purpose as an educational institution so, thank you very much let us uh, discuss something on business intelligence about 95 yeah. percent of the enterprises say that all their employees work from home increasing the need for cloud-based self-service business intelligence and collaborative BI applications and tools. Please, we do not know much, particularly I do not know much about it. Can you please uh, educate us with uh, some kind of uh, details I I, in this scenario? How to, how do you see the business intelligence post-COVID situation? Yeah, so business, I see, sometimes these phrases can be confusing and overlapping. What is business analysis is similar to yes, business yes. intelligence. True, so, true, BI, true. so BI is business intelligence. The same thing as business analysis that uh, I have got some intelligently, I'm looking at the data in the business and finding out some good answers that otherwise I wouldn't have found out unless I had seen the data, right? So BI, you know, BI came out when we had the data warehouse, we put a lot of data in a data warehouse, then we, you know, you said Tableau and all these companies, they give you some screens where you can quickly go and look at the data and come up with some reports and some pie charts. And you can see the trends. So post COVID, I think uh, one of the most important things will be, I think this virus has teaching. Somebody said that during second world war, we had, we knew the enemy, we had weapons. And in this time we don't, the enemy is invisible. We can't see the enemy right and it is creating a havoc around the globe so i think naturally the mind goes into what can we do to detect such kind of virus spread can we do any you know uh, like for today for example here the papers came out and said they have finally figured out four or five regions after all this data they have received that surface touching does not give you the, the covid 19 it is the right. it is the crowd in a crowded place limited space when there is you know people are too close to each other so this physical distancing and uh, you know like for example when you sing loudly and speak loudly these uh, particles from your mouth can travel to 10 to 12 feet so that's why yeah. they're sometimes it's not six feet stay away say 10 to 12 feet from each other and don't you know and Especially, they're totally saying that uh, don't go to a place, a congregation. See, they opened up a few places here in uh, May and Memorial Weekend. So people were so fed up staying at home. Hundreds and thousands started crowding in the beaches and all. Now, two weeks later, the, the numbers have gone up. As simple as that, right? Okay. And I'm told that in Orissa, some people are coming, migrants are coming from other parts of the country. and. You know, as soon as they reach a place, then suddenly there is a growth in, in, in the cases. So this analysis, this uh, 
you know, collecting the data and looking at the causes, looking at the regions can make us better prepared next time. I think the, the, the value of data analysis will go up like anything after this uh, COVID-19. Sir, I would love, I am almost in the final stage of our conversation before we go into beyond a question and answer session where uh, participants question will be addressed. I have few more one or two questions uh, for you. Uh, sir, we are in a pandemic situation now and particularly higher education sectors are becoming you know technology driven in the last few months all of us are teachers uh, you know all of us are uh, conducting classes online and we are facing a lot of problem because of connectivity uh, you know electricity supply as well as internet connectivity in our india you know uh, that about uh, uh, 1,250 million mobile phone users are there, but 40% of them have got the internet connectivity in India. So our students, about half of the students, they couldn't connect to our Zoom class or any other platforms. So if we found that it is not effective as uh, we thought initially, and we have to continue within in month of July and August if pandemic situation still prevails. So it is a big challenge for us. What is your uh, suggestion how to manage such challenges using digital technology for offering education online? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I never thought of the, uh, you know, the, the electricity and uh, phone lines and all that are fundamental plumbing. That's the fundamental plumbing for this thing to work. If, you know, if you have electricity power outage, then, you know, this is, this is gone, dead, right? And, uh, Network speed is another thing, you know, when too many people are, you know, especially in India, I've noticed that the social media is, has become a nuisance. I mean, everybody, you know, brags about my, I have so many followers in the Facebook and many times they're wasting time sending good morning and pictures of birds and all that. It's just a complete waste of time. And I think that's what is causing a lot of uh, bandwidth problem issues. But I think coming coming back to your situation, um, eventually, eventually you cannot fully de depend on the uh, today is a hundred percent digital approach because of the social distancing and whatnot. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that in a couple of months, um, we should be able to, uh, you know, you have a big classroom, then you can put some students in distances. And open the windows because if there is window airflow, they say it really is much more effective. And you will start to 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 conduct the classes like that. You know, you can't just say stay at home and we'll continue on this path because this is uh, not sustainable. You may do uh, part and part. You know, just to 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 see how things go. But I don't have an answer to your question honestly. Uh, I think it's a it's all new to every one of us. And uh, I think the, uh, hmm, yeah, because uh, we, we all depend on this Google Meet or Microsoft Team or Zoom or go to, you know, uh, these collaborative tools are at least, I mean, at least in the last hour and a half, we are able to do this without interruption yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have the disruption. Anyway, sir, my last question. Uh, before we go to q and a uh, uh, please enlighten us about the future trends in computer software and specifically what is india's role in computer software in future yeah i have touched on it in my last uh, slide you know long back you know when i was invited to give the keynote at nascom with my friend narayan murthy and all these guys i have been shouting from the rooftop that when is india going to come out of in you know this 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 body shopping and uh, you know, these days we see a lot of people, everybody, every Tom, Dick, Harry is in, in US because of an Indian company sending them with a H-1B visa and they don't go through any studies here. And they just come here, suddenly they buy a TV and a car and they think they have achieved salvation, right? It's, it's really bad because uh, without going deeper into, all they're doing is babysitting old systems that companies don't want to touch. And that's not very glamorous work. That's why we can we can only make a mark. We say India is a software country. I said, where? Tell me one product India has produced that is used by the world. 
it's not mm -hmm. zoom it's not go to meeting it's not windows it's not oracle database what have you produced mm -hmm. so i think we have to we have to have the mentality that we can create i mean flipkart it's a copy of amazon those two guys monsoon guys they came from amazon right you look at any company so called successful nothing innovative it's all copies so we have to figure out we have to go to the state of saying if we want to lead the world in software then we have to be creative we have to innovate we have to come up with something that others don't i think that has to come uh, in the i mean yeah we have the guy from jaipur uh, he did what is that company why o a uh, oh, oyo 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 what is oyo it's a copy oyo of, it's a copy of airbnb it's saying you know rooms yeah. are available on the internet take it i mean i i, I give him credit he's a young kid i give him credit for coming up with that but my point is we are not innovating we are not with where is have we done anything on the cloud have we done anything on the ai front even university research uh, you know there are now the professors at ai uh, skills are so uh, rare that the, the few people who are well known jeffrey hinton some of these people they are they work for google but they they affiliated with the university as a professor the companies are going and begging these professors to come and help in research right so i, I think for india to go the future of india is to start thinking differently as i said non linear thinking ask your your undergraduate students to come up with some ideas that uh, you probably don't know but they will give them a problem and say come up with some ideas i mean years ago i told narayan murthy in one of his one on one meetings in his office in bangalore i said narayan what are you doing you are a billion dollar company now why don't you put uh, 20 kids from your company infosys who are very smart give them a hard problem let them if nothing comes up out of it it's still not a waste well he disappointed me with his answer i mean i know him for a long time i know all these guys from the 80s uh, you know nandan and uh, narayan and all these guys but see that mentality has to change and uh, there are some companies coming up i know and because google has a big office in india and uh, microsoft you know there are some by by osmosis these kids are exposed to a lot of technologies but i think uh, institutes like yours should not feel left out should say that hey we we should do our our bit in in future so future of computing as i think we have covered it it's all uh, uh, ubiquitous computing as i said sensors are very important uh, you have got uh, uh, these wearable computers people have got you know fitbit i, I when i walk it measures my steps and calories and and the steps i climb and it, it syncs with my my iphone and my i watch so every day i know how many steps i have walked how many stairs i have climbed that's a wearable computer example right yes and yes. sensors are everywhere you know like in the pipelines oil pipelines if there is a crack uh, sensors can right. sense it and you can fix that thing without sending people and uh, so a lot of future is uh, amazing to take. we have we don't think we have even started on technology we have a long way to go so tell the yeah. kids to be excited you know not to feel depressed thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i think uh, we have covered a number of uh, topics in the conversation with uh, mr gyanaranjan das he is truly an expert in this field and we are fortunate to have you sir i now i request professor saswati tripathi to just uh, tell us uh, what are the few questions that are from the audience that uh, uh, can be addressed by mr das saswati thank you yeah thank you sir i can see so many questions here on my screen but uh, because of paucity of time we will uh, try to take a theme wise questions one or two uh, so first question by surangini is the use of robotic technology of course can eliminate human errors uh, would it fully automate a classroom can a robot replace a teacher completely or to what extent can it be used in a classroom yeah, i don't think so i if you ask me uh, like uh, you know like uh, somebody asked swami chinmayananda why should i come and listen to your scriptures your uh, pravachans i can read a book 
he said why don't you ask that question to the book book cannot answer it so the the beauty of uh, face to face teachers teaching something is you can ask questions get answers yeah you can train a robot to answer some questions right but i think we are far away from that robots are not uh, to my knowledge uh, they are not being looked at replacement to uh, professors and teaching uh, they you know maybe there are some menial tasks they can do mechanical tasks but uh, uh, maybe they can they can stack books in the library <laughs> so so you know, there are so that's not teaching teaching is is non linear it's not a straightforward thing right you teach a lot of things and then questions come you go in different directions that's the beauty of of teaching and learning uh, i don't think robotics uh, is going to replace that at all thank you sir that is indeed a beautiful answer so the next question uh, many of them have asked is how big data analytics define the future of in, uh, education industry as i said i think uh, we have covered this again yes. what are the data points in educational institutions you have courses you have students you have grades you have uh, um, employment records of how many kids got recruited by who I mean, there's all kinds of data points, right? So now the question is, you know, in the old days, you know, we used to write them all in a big, thick uh, notebook uh, paper. Uh, you can capture all that in a database. You know, typical database used in the educational institution is coursework. A student takes many courses, and a course has got many students. It's called a many-to-many -many relationship, right? So suppose you drop that course, you know, all the students are being affected. So such technologies can be used in capturing the data in a database and doing some simple analysis, at least if nothing else, just keeping on top of what's going on, right? Uh, so, and then you can, you can take that data after the completion of the course and all that, you can do some analysis that uh, how effective the teacher was, what was the, the, the score uh, uh, students, you know, and many, many things you can be creative. It's not ask them the questions you ask on day to day basis. Think a machine can do that. <laughs> what questions you ask, you can do the analysis on that. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, I would request uh, the attendees to please uh, write to us, and the expert team will definitely answer all the questions. So, we started, uh, uh, time flies. We started at 10 and it's 11.30 now. It was indeed a fantastic experience with overwhelming support from the participants. We are overwhelmed with gratitude and we look forward to such continuous support from you. I, Sashwati Tripathi, on behalf of the entire panel of webinar and PGU family, mention my deepest sense of appreciation to our chief speaker, Mr. Gyan Dash, for sparing time with us, even if uh, when it's an odd hour, there and making us aware about the facets of technology and how to build relevant technical skills and secure employability during the situation of pandemic. I extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Professor Parmeshwar Naik, moderator of the session, Professor Samson Marana, initiator of the session, and Professor Bimal Mishra, organizer of the uh, of this session, for their valuable insights. I would also like to thank Professor Mamta Rat. Uh, helping us in framing, uh, taking questions from the audience, and came Pandey for his unending support. Once again, I thank you all, and uh, it's really been a great pleasure. Wish you good health, stay home, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.